not going down that route. This is just where I want to start here to, tonight. I'm going to try to cover a lot of material quickly. So I ain't be able to, I'm going to try my best not to get too many details here. But in, in Ephesians 1.19, one of the things Paul wants us as, as believers in Christ to understand and to be enlightened to is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe. Now when you talk about the power of God in Christianity today, they immediately go to the realm of superstition, right? The power of God and healing and all this other stuff. Paul, Paul's talking more about authority here. And I'm going to show you what he means by this, but he, we'll just keep reading. But he says, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above. Now, one of the things I love about Ephesians is, is Paul, in chapter 3, he talks about us comprehending the height and depth and one of the things you're going to notice in Ephesians is, is the Bible's dealing here with location of things. Y'all ever read over there in Ephesians 6 that we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places? He talks about Satan, the prince. He talks about the course of this world being according to the prince of the power of the air. And then he defines that power of the air in Ephesians 6. That we wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. But notice here what he says about Christ. That, he, that, that God set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above. So you have that spiritual wickedness in high places, but then you have Christ seated at God's right hand far above them. This is the power Paul's wanting you to be enlightened to. Amen? Because you, if you look in chapter 2, and you in verse 1, and you. I love my father for this. I love God because of what he's done. Right? You look at the kings of this world and the princes of this world and all that. And God took, God took what was low in this earth. He took what was lowly and and, and nothing. He took, he took men like me. When I was dead in sins, Bill, dead in trespasses, he took me, quickened me with his son, raised me up with him, and seated me in the heavenly places in his son. And so right now as I sit here, I am seated with the Lord Jesus Christ in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but that which also is to come. In Christ. Not in myself, but in Him. Yes, sir. And this is what Paul's wanting you. The, the, the book of Ephesians is all about two becoming one. And what he wants us to understand is that God has taken Jew and Gentile and made them one new man in Christ and we are now bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And he wants us to see who we are in God's son. Not just dead with him. Not just buried with him. Not just risen with him. But the very heights of our exaltation in the son of God. This is the power he's wanting us to comprehend. Look at what he says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, I get this, but also that which is to come. You know what that verse tells me? Sometimes you got to think about stuff, guys. You just don't read it and tell God how, how proud he needs to be of you because you read 83 verses tonight. Sometimes you got to think about stuff, right? That verse tells me there's a, a change of power coming. Because not only is Christ's name above everything that is named in this world, but also that which is to come. Telling me that this present world and the things that are right now are going to give way to some things in the future. So you have the world that now is and that one which is to come. But notice what God did with his son. When he set him there far above all principality and power, he didn't just do that. Verse 22, he hath, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so that's about the body. You are not the fullness of Christ in and of yourself. But the body as a whole, we're talking about millions of people that have been saved. Since the book of Acts onward. For 2,000 years, God has been calling Jew and Gentile out of this world through the gospel to reconcile them to himself in one body, and that body is his son's fullness. Yes, sir. And I'm just a member of it. I'm a measure of it. But I, God, Bill, I don't care how little he gave me in his son. It was more than I deserved. There you go. Whatever measure I get in the son of God, Right? It's purely through the riches of God's goodness and grace that he chose to freely give me in, in his son before the foundation of the world. But what I want you to understand here tonight is what, what Paul is talking about here as far as the body of Christ is concerned. What Paul wants us to understand in the text is the power that God that is now to us who believe and he wants you to understand this power through understanding the resurrection and exaltation of God's Son. So Jesus Christ, look over in Ephesians 4. Look in Ephesians 4. Just look at verse 9. Is that the verse that says, Now he that, he that ascended is the same also that descended, or something to that effect? Somebody read it. Now he that ascended... Now you see that? This Jesus Christ, who now ascended up far above all heavens, far above all heavens, that he might fill all things, he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He came, he died on a cross, went into the heart of the earth. God raised him from the dead and highly exalted him to his own right hand, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. Okay? That's who Christ is. What Paul wants you to understand is something in connection with that. That the power God exercised when he raised Christ from the dead and set him up there far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. He made Jesus Christ something else to you. He made him the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Yes, now here's, here's, here's where we're going to get into this thing. I want you to understand something here. God the Father created all things. In fact, let me erase this. Because we've been talking about this on Sunday mornings. Y'all remember us talking about the mystery of God and the mystery of the Father, right? Well, what God has done now is God created all things back in Genesis 1.1, didn't he? Right? Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, both visible and invisible. Which one y'all thinks visible? Yeah, we've looked at this stuff. Visible, invisible. You know what's wrong with you know what's wrong with this world today. Bunch of Christians think what's wrong with the, what's wrong in the world is visible. You don't wrestle right. here. Right there is the problem. Up here in the heavenly realm, before man was ever given dominion of the earth, there was a creature up here that God set as an anointed cherub, and that cherub corrupted his wisdom through his own beauty. Amen. And now, you know, what that, you know what that being up there said, Lucifer? I will be like the most high God. That means possessor of heaven and earth. We've, we've looked at this. But in these two realms, God created heaven and earth and all things that are in them, every creature, and what he did is he created thrones. 
What's next? Thrones. Y'all ain't looking at the passage, are you? Thrones. Dominions, right? So under these thrones are dominions. Now we could get deep into this. I know there's 12 dominions in the heaven. I know that to be a fact. Because we got 12 months. Right? God created a moon and a sun to have dominion over the earth. How many, how many, how many time zones are in the earth? 24. That means there's 12 dominions of darkness and 12 dominions of light. And it's going to help you understand stuff when you start getting into Christ, talking about things being cast into outer darkness. Amen? But you have these 24. Now, I ain't, I'm not trying to get that deep into it, guys. But over these dominions in the heavenly realm, or over these thrones, under these thrones in the heavenly realm, are these dominions. Then what? And these dominions are principalities. Right? Amen? You might, I don't, I don't know how many are in each dominion. What I know is that there's a throne over the dominion, and under, in those dominions, under that throne, are these principalities also. And then under these principalities are powers. Now, Americans today don't understand anything about government anyway. Right? They really don't. Americans don't understand government. But what's the difference between a principality and a power? Well, a judge would be like a principality, right? The judge has power to issue search warrants. A judge can set and issue a, a bench warrant. You don't show up to court, a judge can issue a warrant because you didn't show up to court. It's a bench warrant. They put a warrant out for your arrest. But does that judge ever go and, and enforce that warrant? No, he has sheriffs to do that. The sheriff's a power, right? And so this is how God has set up. You know, you know what we're getting here, guys? It's talking about the kingdom of God, right? Y'all with me, man? Principalities, powers. But these things are also in the earthly realm as well. Okay? Now, if Colossians 1.20, Jesus Christ came into this world to die on a cross to reconcile all things to himself, whether they be things in heaven or things in earth. So you know what that means Christ is going to do? Christ is going to reconcile all all the power, every dominion, every throne, every principality, every power in heaven and earth, he's going to reconcile it back to God. That's what he's at the right hand of God to do. Amen. You ain't going to have to worry about, you ain't going to have to worry about the wickedness and the evil operating in these two realms for much longer. There you go. It ain't going to be around forever. Yet once more, shake out not the earth only, but the heavens also. And I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. That's the book of Haggai. God's put some amazing things in that King James Bible, man. I mean it, he has. Now, you, you think NASA's ever going to see this stuff with the Hubble? You're getting things out of a dime store King James Bible that NASA, you can go, you can go drop $5.99, buy a plain King James Bible and get this information out of it. And NASA can spend trillions of dollars for the next 3,000 years and they're never going to be any wiser to what they're doing or who they are or where they're at. The information God has given dumb hillbillies like us access to into his purpose and will just blows my mind at times. I know I'm a son of God because of what he's teaching me. Amen, I know it. Now you see this? Now what God did is his son first came down into the lower parts of the earth, right? He went and died on a cross. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin and, and condemned sin in the flesh. And then he rose from the dead and then he ascended back to the right hand of God up here 
God in that Bible is called the Most High. The Most High God. That title means that God is the possessor of heaven and earth. And he took this man, Jesus Christ, and sent him up here at his own right hand far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also that which is to come. Amen. Amen. And then he did something else. He gave that same man to be the head of a new creature that he had chose you to be a part of Amen. before he ever created heaven and earth. Amen. Amen. This man up here, Jesus Christ, is the head. Right? All things are under his feet. God has put all this power, all this authority under, under that man's feet. And when he did that, he also made him the head of what is now called the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That's the power Paul wants you to understand. Because who are you? If what I just said is true, who are you? You see all that power and authority God has put under the feet of his son? You are the mechanism by which Jesus Christ is going to feel and exercise his power and authority in creation one day. Amen. Amen. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, wow, right, Bill? <laughs> I tell you this, man. Here's what I know about the body of Christ. I've, I've known some babes in Christ, man, didn't know a whole lot. I've known preachers that I didn't always agree with. I know some preachers that probably wouldn't have anything to do with me just because they're too stupid to understand this stuff. I'd get called a heretic just because they're not spiritual enough to see what I'm talking about. But regardless of the differences I have in those men, I guarantee you, man, if this earth right now was filled with nothing but members of the body of Christ, you wouldn't have to lock your doors tonight. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's a fact. You wouldn't have to worry about somebody stealing your possessions. Amen? We've been, we've been called up here to become heirs of God. And we are the body. By which this head of creation, this head is now going to use this body to exercise that power. And so guess what? The power that God has given his son is being given to us as members of that body. Yes, sir. That's the power Paul wants you to know. Yeah. Not the I can do all things through Christ and then go out there and score a touchdown across yourself. <laughs> See the power working in me. You know how that power is you know made visible today? You know how that power is made visible today? In the sufferings of this present time. This power that the world can't see is made visible in us. In persecution, distress, famine, nakedness, peril. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Wow. And you, you, you know, you, you don't realize it, guys. You don't realize what God is doing through the sufferings of this present time. Paul said, we glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. Everything we're going through in this present time is teaching us how to do all things through this power that now works in us. I can, Paul, by the time Paul's locked up in prison, you know what it says? I can do all things. Oh, that's what I want to know. The power, the power of his resurrection. Amen. Amen. I didn't mean to get this deep into this, but... This is what we call the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. All three now, all three of these, the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, is where all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are. We fully know and understand the will of the creator of heaven and earth now. 
that all this power and authority was created by His Son and for His Son. And His Son came into this world to die to redeem that creation. And then He went back up here as the heir and Son of all this power. And then God revealed the last piece of the puzzle. That He had chosen before the foundation of the world to create this body up here. Seated in the heavenly places as heirs and joint heirs with his sons to become the new power and the new authority of heaven and earth one day. Yeah. I get to go up there and partake in it. I don't know where I'm going to be at in all this. He was like, what are we going to do in heaven? You really expect me to figure that out for you? I have no idea. I have no idea. All I know is I'm going up there for Jesus Christ to place me somewhere in it. And I'm not too big for my britches. I don't think I'm going up there to sit at his right hand. I know my place in this. Amen? I'm just one of these things. I got one head. There's one Lord. Amen? One man died to redeem it, Bill. One man was chosen by God to sit at his right hand. Amen? And I, I want to know him first and foremost. And then wherever he puts me at in eternity, I'll thank him for it. I'll thank him for it because I don't deserve to be there in eternity. Amen? So this body is his fullness, the mechanism by which Jesus Christ feels and exercises the power and authority given to him by God the Father over all of creation. Amen? And so what I want to look at tonight is the body of Christ. As quickly as I possibly can, three things about the body of Christ. It's creation, it's perfecting, And it's glory. Right now you are in the creative and edifying phase of the body of Christ. You are still in the process by which God is creating this new man. And in this, not only is he creating this new creature up here. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Not only are you in the process by which God is creating this new creature. You are also in the process of its edification. And right now, your job as a member of that body is to participate in the edifying of that body. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul's ministry was all about. He didn't worry about anything else. Paul had one concern. That's presenting you perfect in Jesus Christ one day. That was his only concern. The edification of the members, of the, the perfecting of the members for the edifying of the body. And then one day... When God is done making this body, Christ is going to come, call us out of this earth. We're going to rip up through here, sticking our tongues out at the the powers and the principalities that are now up there. And we're going up there far above all heavens to be presented to God the Father for the purpose that he chose us for in Jesus Christ before the world ever began. Bill, that's good, brother. That's good. Amen. These bums, man, when people's always like, people's like, ain't it going to be scary to go up here and see these other be- be- beings? When you get that new body, they're going to be shaking in their boots. You better believe it. You better believe it. Amen. They're going to know you go ripping through the heavens, man, in that new glorified body. They know. Satan already knows. The princes of this world know the mystery. They know where we're going. They know who you are. Now the problem is, is they don't want you to know it. The God of this world wants to keep our minds blinded to this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ who is the image of God. So what about the body? Well, number one, the creation of the body began... When God took his son and raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand, there's the head. We could look at, the, Paul really don't start dealing with this stuff. He deals, he deals elementary with it in the book of Corinthians where he says that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and all that. But Paul really don't start getting into this new creature stuff till you get to the book of Ephesians. He closed Galatians with it. Right, when he says, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but a new what? Creature. 
And you don't really start defining this new creature and educating you on this new creature until you get to the book of Ephesians. But Ephesians chapter 1, we see that God made his son to be the head over all things to the church. Look at 415. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head. See how easy it is to grow up in Christ. It's not complicated, man. You just can't be a child anymore, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Amen. The way you're going to grow up into Christ is through the members of that body speaking the truth to each other in love. Yes, sir. Amen. And through that, through that, th through that truth, we are the only. I want you to think about this, guys. People make fun of us all they want to. Let them. Make fun of them. Point the finger back at them. You are the only people on the earth that have the truth today. Amen. You believe that? Why do you care about Dawkins and Hawking and, and Darwin and the philosophers and the people of this world? You don't owe them a thing. They can't even see what's clearly revealed in creation. You left them guys in Genesis chapter 1 when you believed that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. They're so far behind you they ain't going to catch up at this point. Don't worry about it. You are the only people in this world that have the truth. And the more that truth you get, the more this world and the wisdom of this world is going to poke fun and see you as a fool and despise you and see you as unhonorable and everything else. But don't worry about it. You know who we are? We are the house of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Amen. There's where we're going. Amen. Ain't got to worry about it. Amen? The truth. Like, look over in Ephesians 5. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. That's Jesus Christ. That's who he is. The head of this body. Amen? Now, I mean, I, mean, I wish we could, man, there's so many. I said I wasn't going to get too, too detailed. I'm sitting here looking at six scriptures I want to quote so bad. And I don't think I have time. Let me, let me give you this one. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Saying, let us, cast, let, let us break their bands asunder. Let us cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. He shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare to the decree, thou hast said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of thee, the earth for thy possession. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. But you see, all those Old Testament prophecies that deal with God the Father and his Son, that right there, ask of me, thou art my son, all of those Old Testament prophecies dealt with this realm right here. This is what appears kept secret. Amen. This is what, if the princes of this world had known, if Satan and them would have known nowhere in the Old Testament that God revealed that he was going to make his son the heir and give him dominion over everything in the heavenly places as well. And not only that, but that he was going to take Jew and Gentile, seat them up there with his son in the heavenly places. God never revealed that. You got that? But Christ is the head. Right? Right? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Colossians 1.10. You know what Colossians 1.10 calls him? I don't got to flip there. I want you all to go to 1 Corinthians 6. Colossians 1.10. You know who he is? Or 2.10. You are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. What else you need? 
right? <laughs> Some of y'all trust the welfare office and Social Security office more than you do the, the head of all principality and power. I guarantee you, man, I guarantee you the government could give you a million dollars a day for the next 15 years and you're still going to die and go to the ground. Amen. That, man, that man right there can teach you how to die. Yeah. I've watched Christians die, man. I've watched them. Nothing sweeter. I don't mean to talk about this stuff, man. I've watched, I've watched lost men die. And claw and scratch and fight and, <gasps> and sitting there trying to gasp for every last breath they can get in this earth. And I've watched Christians die. I've watched them. I've watched the Christians leave this world, Bill, in such sweet peace and harmony without sorrow and without fear. Amen. Amen. I love that man. So I've never seen him. But I love him. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 6, 15. The point I'm making about this, man, is there ain't nothing that, there ain't nothing here right now. Get that. Look, look at what I've got written up here, guys. And now think about what Paul said in Romans 8. I'm persuaded that neither height, nor depth, nor powers, nor principalities, nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come. That's when he says, nor height, neither life nor death, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature. There's nothing here that's going to be able to separate you from the love of God in his son, Jesus Christ. The members, look at 1 Corinthians 6, 15 now. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. My what? This thing right here. This goes for all the Christians. Listen, man. When people hear me say this, they, 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 they think that I'm saying, oh, if you're saved, you'll be sinless. That's not what I'm saying at all. I've got flesh just like you got flesh. And that flesh lusteth against the Spirit of God. I know that. There is enmity against God in my flesh. My flesh is operating on a principle and a law that is not subject to God. But I tell you this about my body. If my body is a member of Christ, that means this body I now live in is supposed to be subject to that head up there. Yeah. there you go. And anybody thinks that they're just because they're under grace that it's okay to keep walking through this earth in subjection to sin and letting it reign in their mortal body don't understand who they are or what they've been called Amen. into. Amen, preacher. Christ, that power that's up there, the power that God has set up here to operate through all this power and, and dominion in heaven and earth is now to us who believe. And that power that works in us is able to do exceeding above, abundantly above all that we ask or think. But my body is the member of Christ. Look at what he says though. What? Verse 16, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one what? Flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one what? Spirit. So now he's showing me how I'm joined to Christ. How my body is joined to him. How? By one spirit. Okay. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. And I'm going to draw this out here in a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is dealing with the individual now. Just me, individually, me as a member. We are one body with many members. So there's individual and there's corporate into this. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit... Are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit? See how you got into that body? 
You get into that body by baptism of one spirit, by one spirit. Amen. And that, that, listen, man, spirit and water are not the same. Amen. Amen. Yes, you know, you can get baptized in water to join a local church, but that ain't going to get you into that thing there. Yes, sir. Amen. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Amen. Look at, first, look at Galatians 3. How do we get that baptism? Galatians 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Right? So he that is joined, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now my body is a member, a physical member of the body of Christ, but that union to Christ is by one spirit. We, we that are joined to the Lord are one spirit. The moment that I received the spirit of God through the hearing of faith, I became baptized I was baptized into that body by that spirit, and I'm now joined to Christ in one spirit. Therefore, I, listen, man, and I know it's hard for carnal minds to grasp this truth, but I've been learning it for 20 years of my life now. I can see things, Bill, that I cannot see. I'm joined to a realm. Paul wouldn't tell you to seek things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God, if it weren't possible. I have access now by one spirit into Christ. I can see things that I can't see, hear things that ear cannot hear, uh, have things in my heart that have never entered into the heart of man. Yes, sir. We walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah. Right? Get this now. What's Paul talking about here? Well, that little... If you remember back in 1 Corinthians, the, the spirit there was a little s. 1 Corinthians 12, the spirit is a capital S. Here's how this thing works. Jesus Christ up there at the right hand of God has that spirit in him. The way I get in to this union with Christ is by what? One spirit. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Make no mistake about it. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. Amen. I don't care. You can get dunked in water a hundred times. You can take sacraments, confess the priest, cross yourself, five or fathers and 10,000, holy Marys, whatever you want to do. If you don't have Christ in you, you are none of his. You say, how do I get it? Through faith. Right. Now you see this? Here's me over here. And through this union to Christ, by one spirit, I'm now in union with this head up here that's now seated at God's right hand. Now, that's just the beginning of it, guys. That's what happened the moment I believed the gospel. And the longer I'm in this thing, the more I realize that through this unity right here, I have access to everything I need. I'm complete in Him. Righteousness, wisdom, holiness, life, power. I have it all in God's Son. You, you, you say, how do you get it? God gave you His Son in that book. Yes, sir. He sent forth the Spirit of His Son. Do you believe that? Amen. We know that God loves us. You know how we know God loves us? He gave us of His Spirit. That Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Let me tell you something. Religion that's always trying to get you to doubt this stuff is not a religion of God's Spirit. Amen. 
God's Spirit didn't come to condemn you any more than Christ came to condemn you. God's Spirit bears witness that we are the children of God. You know what that means? That means any spirit in this world not bearing witness to your adoption in Christ is a liar. Tell them I said so. I got into Christ by one spirit, man. I didn't know it at the time, Bill, but it's been good. That day, that day, God took what was dead, quickened it and raised it and seated it up here in the heavenly places in His Son. But you've got to understand that ain't physical. Physically, you're right here. But that spirit that's in you is up here. Until you start looking to see spiritual things, you're never going to be able to see this stuff. I'm not seated in Christ in flesh and blood. I'm seated in Him in one spirit. The same spirit that's in Him is in me. And guess what? The more that spirit is formed in me, guess what? The more, listen, you got the spirit in you, I got the spirit in me. Not only are we now seated in Christ in heavenly places, but we are united in each other in one spirit, growing closer and closer together by that spirit, right? So that's the members of it. You got the head, the members. Real quick, look at Ephesians 4. I mean, I hear people talk, man, just body of Christ, body of Christ. And listen, man, I don't, this is deep. I know it's deep. And I don't get on to people, man, that's been saved three, four, five years or just coming into the knowledge of this stuff, man, not understanding it completely. What I get upset about is that it's been in writing for 2,000 years and the annals of church history is absolutely void of this information. Meaning a lot of men been down here teaching the Bible and this stuff has just gone by the wayside. You know how many people running around that they think they're Jews? Jew and Gentile still exist, but not there. Jew and Gentile was crucified there and made a new creature here. Now the Jew and Gentiles got a program out here going out into the ages to come. You've been called out of this to become something new. Yes, sir. That thing up there is not male or female. Amen? So not only did God give Gentiles access to something, He gave you women's access to something that you didn't have either. Now right now you women got a life to live in the flesh. God calls you daughters. As long as you're down here in this earth, you are a woman, you are under male, male authority, under male headship. But when that day of inheritance comes, you're going to be treated as a son. Neither male nor female. Gentiles are going to be treated in a way that, that, that they were never treated before. We are being treated. We were aliens, Bill, strangers. Strangers. And now we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Yeah. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Y'all see a lot of that going on? I see a lot of fighting about water baptism on Facebook. I tell you what, man, you can always know when carnality is at work. Because carnality tears this unity to shreds every chance it gets. I love my brothers in Christ, regardless of how little, how weak, regardless of what they don't know. I love my brothers in Christ. I love God's family. I love God's children. 
And the, more, the longer I'm saved and the more Christ is in me. You know one of the evidences of this spiritual maturity? You know, what, you, know how, you know what Christ thinks about that body? He loved it and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. The way you know you're growing up into him is when you love that body the way he loves that body. Quit trying, to, quit trying to look for every reason in the world to say, I'm a better preacher than that guy. I don't agree with him on that. Y'all don't need to listen to him. Listen to me. Listen to me. I've watched that. You listen, man, you know what that is? That's a bunch of puffed up fleshly people. Amen. Paul tells us to endeavor to keep this unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Not in fleshly, puffed up knowledge of a bunch of carnal people that have splintered the body of Christ. Remember what Paul asked the Corinthians? Is Christ divided? Now, I understand there's some false doctrine in this world, guys. And we are not to be tolerant of false doctrine. There are some people you are taught... But I'm, what I'm telling you as a son of God, you need to get in that book and realize, listen, Paul doesn't, t he said, Mark, and avoid some people. Withdraw thyself. Shun. Avoid. Then there's people out there, he says, you must be gentle, apt to teach, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Amen? It's going to take wisdom. To understand how to, how, to, how to walk as a worthy member of this new creature that God's called us to be. Because the new creature is already alive and well. Yeah. We are down here right now as members of this body up there. Amen. And Christ has us doing, he has us in this earth to do something. And we need to understand where we are in this process of this new creature in order for us to participate in what God is doing today. But look at the sevenfold unity. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called and one hope of your calling. This body of Christ has one hope. Now, every member is going up here, but the body has one hope. Amen? The body's going up there. To be heirs of God. Amen. Now what I'm going to get as a part of that inheritance, I don't know. I'll wait and see. I get a portion. Amen? Where God's going to place me. What Paul means about one hope of our calling is the body of Christ is going up there to be heirs. But each member is going to get its own measure in the inheritance. Amen? But there's one hope of our calling. Look at this. One Lord. And it ain't Shelton Smith. And it ain't me. Amen. There's one Lord. One faith. Amen. Look at Ephesians 4.13. Till we all come in the unity of the what? Faith. You know what that tells me? When I find a believer in Christ. Guys, this is why I do what I do, man. I go, I go man, I preach anywhere. God give me the opportunity to preach. Amen, I go down to Stephen Carter's once a month. I love going down there and teaching them people. Amen, I do Zoom calls, man. Some of, some of, you, some of you get on, I mean, yeah, Dave Fitzpatrick gets on some of them. Bill, there's times I get on Zoom at 8 o'clock at night at 4.30 in the morning. I'm still sitting on there with people. I'm addicted to this thing. You got questions for me, I've got answers. And if I don't, man, we'll try to figure them out. But I know this, I know what, we are and who we are. And I know that, that the most important thing in this life is the ministration of that spirit into the members of that body for their own perfecting. The more, the more we get that, people always want to come together, come together, let's just come together. And the world don't know how to come together except through tolerance of each other's nonsense. When that spirit's in you, you don't need ecumenicalism. You don't have to say, well, let's just put aside our doctrinal differences. Mm -hmm. There's one faith in this thing. And Paul wants us all, as members of this body, to come in the unity of the faith. There's only one faith. The members of this body have to be subject to the faith that God has made known in that book. 
One faith, one baptism, I love this, one God and Father who is above all, through all, and in you all. Wow. Now look at what he says in verse 7. I'm going to have to close here in a second. Verse 7, but unto every one of us. Now you see what the body is. People always like to hide behind corporate identity. You ever notice that? I notice it. People love to hide in, in big groups. Right? After all that unity, Paul just said, notice he says, but. Guys, you ain't, you ain't living off of Christ and somebody else. Amen. You can't live off of me. I'll minister to you, man. Everything Christ has given me, I'll freely give you. But you can't live off of me. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? There's a corporate identity that each individual member is to endeavor to keep this unity. But unto every one of us as individuals is given grace according to the measure you see that measure? What is that measure? Look back in Ephesians 4. Unto every one of us is given grace. And y'all have to understand this, man. And I know we're rushing through some of this stuff. When Paul comes to Ephesians 4 and he starts talking about the measure of the gift, don't y'all believe that Paul would not say something like that unless he's already previously talked about it? Right? Look in chapter 3. Verse 1. For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of what? The grace of God given to me to what? You were. So there was grace given to Paul, dispensed to Paul toward us. Paul was a minister of that grace. Right? Look at verse 7. Is that where he says, uh, I'm made a minister? According to the gift of what? The grace of God. Given to me by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of who? Christ. So what was Paul preaching to us? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Remember what he said in Colossians? To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory, the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. After Paul gets done talking about this dispensation of grace given to him for us, you know what his prayer is? Is that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by his spirit with might in your inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's the measure. You know what's being given to you? You know what's being, you know what's being given to you through this? The gift of Christ. We've all got a measure right now, guys. There's in every one of us is a measure of Christ in us. Remember what the body is? His fullness. This body is His fullness. You know what that tells me? As a member of that fullness, as a member of that body, participating to, to make up the fullness of Christ, I can only participate in that body according to the measure of Christ in me. So what's the most important thing? Well, if your body's a member of Christ, now this is how this thing works, man, in your individual life. If Christ, up here's Jesus Christ. You ain't, there's only one spirit, man. It's right there. You can, take every, you can take everything else and just flush it down the commode. Just get rid of it, man. Philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men, there's one spirit and it's right there. 
through that spirit being ministered to me, right? This measure, this, this mind, this spirit being ministered to my mind, Christ dwelling in my heart by faith, then what happens? This body over here, the, bo the body over here becomes a member of Christ. You see that? But it all is about this spirit working in me, right? And the more of Christ I have in me, guess what, guess what I'm going to be able to use this body for? Guess what I'm going to be able to give you? Guess what you're going to be able to give other people? Amen. Guys, listen, man, I believe in taking care of your family. I believe in giving your kids stuff. I believe in feeding your kids and clothing them. The greatest thing you can give anybody in this world is Jesus Christ. Amen. But in order for you, you know what Paul told the Corinthians? You are our epistle written in our hearts. Where was it written? Where were Paul's epistles written? They were written in his heart. And he said, our heart is enlarged. Our heart is enlarged. Our mouth is open. You know what he's saying? My heart is enlarged to receive these things of the Spirit of God, and my mouth is open to minister them unto you. Because you are our epistles, ministered not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Amen, guys. Last verse, look at Ephesians 4 again. You know what that is? This right here is your individual perfecting. Because what was dispensed by Jesus Christ when he went back up here, you know what he gave? He dispensed gifts unto men. The spoils of his victory. The spoils of, of, of the one who took captive. You know what he did? He took captivity captive. This whole realm was brought into captivity to him. And then he sent back to us, the members of his body, this grace, this, these gifts. And Paul said that these gifts were given for the perfecting of the saints. That's the individual. What is my perfecting for? For the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry for? For the edifying of the body of Christ. My individual perfecting. Is for the ministration of edifying the body. Amen. My perfecting is for the purpose of perfecting Christ in you. Amen. Growing. Now look, look at what he says there in Ephesians 4.13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ. You see that? Here's, here's the beautiful thing about this. I don't have it all. I've, I've been around preachers my whole life, man. Uh, Brother Dave come in here a little bit ago and he said, what do you think about Justin Johnson? I say he's a good Bible teacher. Hey, man, you're going to learn things from Justin I can't teach. David Osteen, love him to death, great Bible teacher. David Reed, now, now some, those men probably, those men be like, I wouldn't listen to him. I'm beyond that stuff. I'm beyond it. Because all those men can supply things to you that I can't. And I can supply things to you that they can't. Because here's, look at what Paul says there in Ephesians 4, 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom, from whom, the whole body, fitly joined together, compacted by that which every what? Joint. You know what a joint is? It's what connects two members. See that? Got a joint or an arm, a, a, a member here and a member here. That joint connects them. Well, where's our union to each other? 
Amen? We ain't unified in flesh. We're unified in one spirit. And we, listen, when I grow up into Christ and you grow up into Christ, guess what? Christ, that head, takes me and you and fitly joins us together. Just like my body is fitly joined together. And then guess what? Through that joint, I supply to you, you supply to me. And guess what? That unity that we're already in, through you giving me what I don't have and me giving you what you don't have, we become compacted even tighter together. And through me supplying Christ in me to you and you supplying Christ in you to me, guess what? Guess what? We're all coming together, not just in an individual measure of Christ in myself, but we're coming into the measure of the stature of His fullness. Amen. You've got to get over yourselves. Don't listen to anybody but me. I'm scared to death that you might listen to anybody but me. Man, if you can get Christ out of somebody, get Him. Get Him. And then when you get Him, come share it with me. Amen? And I don't care where you got it. You don't have to tell me, oh, I heard so-and-so say this, because it ain't. I don't care about so-and-so. We're all getting it from him. Y'all understand? And so where we are right now, Bill, we are in the creative stage. So as a man on this earth, and I'm closing, I promise you, as a man on this earth, I know two things. God's creating a new man, and he's edifying that. And so what should I be doing down here? I should be preaching the gospel to get individuals into that body. And then I should be taking what Christ is teaching me and ministering it to the other members of that body for their own perfecting and for their own growing up so that we can all be edified for that day of our presentation. You are my joy. Don't make any mistake about it, man. Listen, man, I can come and do physical things for you. You ever call me, man, I'll be glad. I, I, I don't care to do physical stuff. But I'm telling you the most important thing I do every day is getting that book to get Jesus Christ to me so I can come over here and give him to you. Yes, sir. That's it. And the more we got, listen, man, I know I love this church, man. We're all growing together. I, I see it in this church. Corin and them boys, man, them guys talk about things I wasn't even thinking about at 25. I mean it, man. Carly back there, man, that's a sharp Bible student back there. I mean, anybody that teach Hosea to the women, man, has got a death wish or something, man. That's a <laughs> but we know what we should be doing. Three things. Getting men in Christ. Perfecting. Getting Christ perfected in ourselves. And then through Christ and us, ministering to the other members for the perfecting and edification of that body. So that we can come into that perfect man under this measure of the fullness of Christ. And then one day, Christ is going to come get us out of here. Amen. And then all this power and authority has been put under his feet. I don't know how it's going to work, guys. What I know is what you're going to, I do know this. Where you're going to be placed, man, I mean, goodness gracious, guys, we can't even, we can't even sit here and draw all the members on this thing. Bunyan and Schofield and Larkin and, you know, Fanny Crosby, just think about it, man. Ain't that some people you want to spend eternity with? The Apostle Paul, you know, all up through here, man, Christ is going to Use this body to feel all things. But where you're going to be placed is in accordance to the fullness of Christ in you. Yeah. And Paul makes that clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, man, about the resurrection from the dead. He says, some man will say, how are the dead raised and with what body does it come up? He says, you fool." He says, that which you sow is not that, it does not. He says, that which you sow is, uh, you know, basically doesn't come up unless it first dies. I can't even remember the passage. But what he ends up saying is there, is Paul explains this whole resurrection process. And he talks about how God gives every seed that goes into the ground, God gives it a body 
as pleasing to him. You know what that means? To, and he says, to every seed his own body. At the resurrection, and you're, listen, you believe the gospel, you're going. Just get over it, you're going. At the resurrection, we all get our own body. And we're going to get a body as it's pleasing to God. Not everybody's going to have the same power and the same glory in this body. Amen? God's going to give everybody a body as it's pleasing to him. Then Paul says, do all, he, says all, he says all flesh is not the same flesh. There's a flesh of birds. Where do the birds live? A flesh of fish, where do they live? And a flesh of men and a flesh of beasts, where do they live? You know what Paul's telling you there? That God gave those creatures bodies depending on where he had for them to serve and live. A fish has a body for the water, bird has a, fit, a body for the air, and beasts have body for the field. So in this resurrection, you're getting a body in accordance to where God wants you. Amen? Then he says this, there are not only bodies terrestrial, but bodies celestial. That's heavenly, earthly. Then he says there's one glory of the sun, one glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, and one star differeth from another star in glory. The heavenly bodies have varying degrees of glory. Got that? Then he says, so also is the resurrection from the dead. Amen. The judgment seat of Christ is real. You are going to be examined. Not here. You get a new one of those. So if I'm getting a new body, what's going to be left for God to judge? The doctrinal edification of my inner man. Come here, son. How much did you learn of my mind? How much wisdom, understanding, instruction, reproof, prudence? How much of my doctrine did you learn? How trustworthy are you? And then he's going to place you somewhere here based upon your ability. All scriptures given that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. God's going to be judging your furnishing unto good works. That's his doctrine built up in you. Amen. Any questions? Any confusion? Any heartburn? <laughs> Uh, that's good stuff, guys. That stuff, that stuff helps me so much, man. Not, not just for myself, man, but to understand the important thing over here. And, uh, but if there's no questions, we'll pray. I'm sorry I went so long. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here tonight. Lord, I, I love each and every one of them. God, I'm just so thankful be able to have the, the spiritual understanding and the knowledge and the wisdom that you've given me through this book to be able to share it with them. And God, I, I know that this stuff is deep and, and, and uh, it can be uh, uh, dark. It's, it's the dark words, as Proverbs said, the dark words of the wise. And Lord, it's hard to comprehend and to perceive these things at times, Father, but I just pray that these words would go into the minds and hearts of your people and that over time, Lord, they would meditate upon them and that their inner man would be able to see the great truths and the light that is in this doctrine lord help us to grow up together and to love each other lord and to and to have no other goal but to glorify your son in our mortal bodies and god we just ask it all in the holy and precious name of our savior jesus christ amen